I will lose my life. And those generations depend on me. And I will teach and encourage all of mine to do the same. Silverback! Silverback! And I say this in my 26 years, this is the first program that I've seen an immediate impact, especially, especially with boys. Welcome to the new monthly Silverback Society Show. I'm your moderator, Norman Robinson. You know, the Silverback Society is an organization of African-American men dedicated to raising and mentoring boys without fathers. Joining me now is Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Silverback Society, Mr. Lloyd Dennis. Lloyd, thanks for being here. <laughs> thanks for having me, though. No. Uh, and you know I'm all excited about this. Uh, well, it's something to be excited about, because this is, this is really making a terrific impact. Uh, so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Norman Francis is a silverback. And when I say a silverback, he's been committed to this work for the last, what, two and a half, three years. People always uh, confuse me with Norman Francis. Oh, yeah? I almost said that? <laughs> you did say okay. that. Norman Robinson. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it's not, that was, that's not a bad thing to be No, it's not. <laughs> you know, he and I tease each other about that all but the time. But he's been doing this work for the last couple of years. And, uh, and what I mean by doing the work is we have a couple of roles in the Silverback Society. One is as a speaker, and uh, that's what Norman does. Norman goes from site to site and talks to little boys, tells his story, basically, how he grew up, how he got to be who he was, the things he went through in life. And, uh, I, be, and I understand it's a very compelling story, and uh, when he does that, little boys get the understanding that they can do it too. That's an amazing thing, how just telling your story, yeah. how relating who you are right. and how you got to be who you are makes a difference to these young boys. And, and, it's, and what's interesting is that that aspect of the Silverback Society kind of happened uh, happenstance. Uh, when Pastor and I, Pastor Arthur Wadsworth and I began, we had a curriculum of like six lessons. Mm -hmm. And then when we finished the curriculum, we didn't know what the heck to do. <laughs> and so uh, we ended up doing some stuff, trying to taking the kids out on the yard. And then we said, well, let's bring in some speakers. And we assumed that we were going to bring speakers in and that the kids were going to be not interested. Mm -hmm. Man, guys came in and started telling their stories. Not motivational speeches, you know, but just came in and shared with these boys how they went from being little boys like them to who they are today and how much they enjoy it. And the kids are sitting there like, in their mouth the whole time. And it was just amazing. And, and so since then, we, we've made that part of the process. So we have two roles for men in the Silverback Society. We have the mentors who show up every week at the same school and work with the same group of boys. And then we have the speakers, such as, such as what Norman does and some other guys, Terry Hardy with the fire department. And they go around to all the different schools and share their stories with the boys. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, so Norman started doing that work. And, and before he did it, he, you know, before he retired uh, from, from WDSU, he, say, he told me, he said, you know, when I retire, I really want to get involved with the Silverback Society. I'm like, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Norman Francis is going to get involved with the Silverback Society. And so I, and he called me. And he said, so what do you need me to do? And at, for, you originally wanted to be a mentor. You yeah. wanted to go to a school and work at that school. And I asked him, what, te you know, what, what, what were the other principals at the other schools going to say when I say Norman Robinson is at a school? So we decided we had to share Norman Robinson. And uh, he's been at it, and, and uh, he's, he, he schedules himself, he shows up, and, uh, and, and it's been really, really important to us in the Silverback Society. Uh, cause, and, you, you know, and you're not the only one, just amazing man. Norman's an amazing man. We, you guys hear from a couple other amazing men today. How many men do we have all 120. 120 men. 120 working in 17 schools uh, this year with 465 boys. Um, amazing men. So you're talking about ordinary men who are doing extraordinary things. And the most important thing they're doing I, is... I like the way you put that. Yeah. Right? And the most important thing they're doing is raising their families. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, the men in the Silverback Society, uh, if they have children... Uh, the first thing that we communicate, try and communicate, is make sure that this man is, is in his children's life and doing what he needs to do 
for his children, because that's what we need little boys to do, is see themselves as being what children need them to be, and becoming what children need them to become. Uh, and it's, it's, it's important to me, and it's unique in a sense that you're just looking, you're looking for men who are doing the work. You're not looking for yeah. superstars, no. you're not looking for no. celebrities. We, we don't even use celebrities or sports figures. Because the boys kind of, you know, that's that fantasy world. Mm -hmm. And their mind is already kind of filled with that because they get to see that on television. Mm -hmm. What they don't get to see on television is the engineers, the lawyers, the firefighters, the business people, the, the you know, we, well, we have people who run TV stations. We have, we have all kinds of guys. We have guys that, that, that work at airports, uh, engineers. So but that's what they don't get to see. And they don't get to hear how good those men feel about themselves and what they're able to do for their children. And we're talking about little boys whose lives have not had men mm -hmm. who were able to do for their children. Uh, and and it's, an, it's an interesting thing. Uh, but I, I, so they, we talk about 52% black male unemployment. But if you dig down into that same study, what you'll find is since 1980, post-secondary school, in other words, after high school, only 15% of black males go on to learn to do some more, learn trade or, or college. 66% are white males. So when a black guy and a white guy show up to apply for the same job, it's a high likelihood that the white guy is more. So that's why we grab these kids mm -hmm. early on and get them to understand that if you finish high school good, you'll be all right. But, but I got to tell you, I, asked, I didn't ask no I'm going to do the show. I was afraid to do that. But he, he just said, when I say we were going to do the show, you got this big smile. It's what I do. It's what he does. It's the, and that's what we do. That's what makes the Silverback Society such a great yeah. program is every man does but what he does. does. Right. Absolutely. Right. And we're all different. We all yeah. have different talents. Well, we're going to have you back because I want to see you do the demonstration with the rope that you do that's so compelling. Okay. So the next show, you have to do that. What's your show? All right, buddy. <laughs> we pause now for a short break. But... When we come back, we'll delve into the early history of the Silverback Society, so don't go far. All right, boy. My life is full of statistics. Thing is, I could have dropped out of school and become one myself, but I didn't because I had people that believed in me. Here's another statistic. 7,000 students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. It's time that students know that we believe in them. Inspire a student and share your message of support at boostup.org. NFC, AFC, offensive linemen, defensive tackles, quarterbacks, and cornerbacks are all working with United Way for a million little reasons, the kids of our communities, to ensure their academic success all the way to graduation day. You see, it takes about 12 years to create a graduate, but it takes the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a kid becoming one or the other could be a professional athlete or it could be you. Studies show the earlier we get to kids, the better their chances. So become a United Way volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor, and make a difference in the life of a child, for the life of that child. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Join your favorite NFL players. Take the pledge. Go to unitedway.org. thousand high school students drop out every school day. Let's catch them before it's too late. To start helping students in your community, visit boostup.org.
Welcome back to the Silverback Society Show. Now with me, Silverback Society Board Chairman, Mr. Duan Hernandez, and Board Member Dwayne Steele. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. As the pecking order would have it, let's start with the Board Chairman. <laughs> Give us your involvement with the, with the Silverback Society in its early history. Sure. So, like many of us, I started out as a mentor in the Silverback Society and uh, had a lot of respect for, for, for Lloyd and for Pastor Wadsworth, whom I had known for quite some time. And I knew about the work that they were doing, and Lloyd and I, just by happenstance, were talking one day, and he got me involved in Murray Henderson Elementary School. Uh which was a phenomenal experience. Now, you know, at the time I had young children and working a job that required me to travel quite a bit, so the commitment got to be more than I could handle at that time, but, but I was doing it for a solid year. The next year I found myself, like, like so many of us have to do, uh, to take some time uh, to focus on what I was supposed to be doing every day. Yeah. Uh, but I uh, came back the following year and, and have stayed committed ever since. And. Uh, it was an amazing experience, and as I tell the young men all the time, it, it was as important for me as a mentor as it was for them, because in order for me to stand there and talk to them about the principles that we espouse, I had to make sure I was living those principles, and I would have to stop and check myself, and, and if I were not, then I needed to take whatever corrective action I needed to take so that I could be the example that they needed me to be. What about you, Dwayne? Uh, Dewan and I kind of had the same path. I mean, it was one of those situations in which uh, Pastor Wadsworth, who was one of the co-founders along with Lloyd, uh, had passed away. Uh, and it was at his funeral that uh, Dewan and I both ran into Lloyd and we had talked about the work once before and told him that if he was still doing it and still needed volunteers, that we would be willing to do it. Uh, and that's how I started. I started by volunteering at Murray Henderson with Dewan was my first site where I was as far as mentoring. It was a growing experience for me. I was a new father probably at that point uh, with my kids, and it's very fulfilling working with the youth and then now serving on the board and still working with the youth, and I'm currently at Havens, which is also on the West Bank and working with kids over there. I'm gonna just throw this out here for both of you. Sure. What has been your, your most profound experience in dealing with these young 13 and 14 year olds? Oh. So there's a story that I tell all the time, and I always invite Lloyd to tell this story. When Lloyd and I, one year, were headed to Murray Henderson School, we walk in the door of the school, and there is a mother and a son sitting on the sofa as we're walking in the door. And uh, the mother is dressed in a T-shirt and a, a scarf on her head, the kind that you go to sleep in, and slippers and, and a pair of sweatpants, and the little boy sitting on the sofa, he's just as mad as mad could be. <laughs> and uh, Lloyd and I go into the principal's office, and uh, we're talking to the principal about what we're going to be doing this year, and Lloyd asked her, what's going on with that kid outside? And she tells us, oh, well, we just put him out. You know, he's, uh, he's cussed out the teacher, he's cussed out me, he's cussed out everybody around here, and, and he is just more than we can bear at the moment. And, you know, Lloyd and I started talking to her, and, and long story short, uh, she said that she would allow him to stay in the school if we would take him. And that is just the kind of challenge that we look for. And so we began to spend time with him, and, and, and Lloyd is just a master at being able to help children see the whole picture. And this young man went from cussing teachers out, fighting in school every day, uh, a complete disruption, to a year later being one of the most productive students in that school, on the honor roll, uh, a leader in the school, not a disruption anymore. Went on to high school very much the same way, joined the band, just became this exemplary young man. But that, that, that came through the expression of love of the Silverback Society and, and, the, and, and the discussion of real simple tenets that, that, that we talk about as an organization. And, and, and they're really things that guide everyday life such that the young men grab them like that. It makes sense to them. You know, I used to laugh all the time about, if you remember, Nancy Reagan had her just say no to yeah, drugs just campaign. Say no. But you know, I'd, I'd, I'd always say, well, you, you can't say no, you can't teach a young man how to say no to drugs if you haven't had to say it yourself. And, and, and that's what we're teaching these young men. You know, we, we've lived the life they're living. Many of these men who are mentors in this program have experienced 
much of what they're experiencing. As I tell my son all, all the time, I, there's not much he has done or is going to do in his life that I haven't had some kind of experience with. So trust me when I try to help you understand what you're dealing with. So the, that's my most profound experience. So watch this young man turn completely around into the productive young man that we were all hoping he would become. I'm going to get Dwayne's take on that, that question. Then I'm going to come back to both of you and ask you how you make that connection because a lot of us are intimidated by sure. youngsters. We don't know how to begin a conversation with them. Sure. So, Dwayne, what's your most profound experience with these young boys? Yeah, my most profound experience with them has been watching them on the turnaround. And what I mean by that is when we initially walk into most classrooms and we talk to the kids, they're all thinking about being professional athletes. They're not thinking about all the other things that life has to offer from the academic perspective. So in going through the process and having role models and mentors who've come in every week and speak to them, by the end of the year, those kids are no longer talking about being a professional athlete as the single thing that they want to do. You have people talking about, or young men talking about becoming a doctor, becoming a lawyer, becoming an architect. That is the most profound thing that I've seen this program do, because what we're doing is we're putting people in their classroom who they can see, feel, and touch. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. You know, I had a conversation yesterday evening with a friend, and we were talking about one of the presidents of the university, local university, who was saying about his experience with the young man who had been caught up in crime and drugs, and that in his conversation with that young man, he realized how brilliant this young man was and that that person could have been a doctor from his school if he had gone in the right direction and had been given the opportunity. So having these young men have the experience of knowing the difference and figuring out the difference between what's right and what's wrong and having the opportunity to become that doctor and lawyer, we're way ahead of the game. And that has been my most profound experience with the Silverback is knowing that these kids no longer think about just becoming an athlete or working some menial job where they can't progress, but they're thinking about going to college now. Well, how do you get to that point? When you walk into a classroom for the first time you meet these boys, obviously they're looking at you, there's this disconnect. Mm -hmm. Automatically there's a disconnect, there's a distrust because there's been no relationship sure. up, up to that point. How do you make the connection? So I, I would say we all as mentors have our own way of making the connection, but you, you know, children can figure out really quickly who loves them and who doesn't, who respects them, who doesn't, who cares about them and who doesn't. And when we come into the classroom, the very first thing we start with is working to gain their trust. If you remember, you're talking about a lot of young men who have for their entire lives been let down by men. Mm -hmm. and so. We make them simple promises. You know, it starts with, we're going to be here every week we say we're going to be here. We're going to be here on time at the time we say we're going to be here. And you'll never have to wonder about what happened to us because we're going to be here for you. Now, you know, that all sounds like a lot of great talk the first time out. But by the third week, they begin to realize, oh, they really did mean it. And then we also let them know, there's nothing you can do that's going to keep us from coming back. And so by the fourth week, we're still there, even when they're antsy, even when maybe sometimes they're losing their attention, but they come back to us. And what they begin to realize is there really is a relationship building between us and them. And, and then what we try to do is try to teach them how to manage their environment, how to manage themselves. And they begin to trust us because we don't come in preaching to them. This, this is not the, let me tell you what you better do, our. Uh, it is the... Let me tell you how I got there, our, and then let's see if you can find some, some commonality in what I am saying to you and what my experience has been and in what you're going through. And, and then they begin to understand that, that we really do live the story that they're living in every day. And that forms a bond of trust. And that, that's a phenomenal thing to watch. And then normally we also challenge them. We challenge their paradigm of thought. So, you know, Dwayne was mentioning earlier that, you know, a lot of those kids want to be athletes and they want to be the things they see on TV. You know, they've been watching Empire, so they want to be these big rappers now and be what they call them moguls. Yeah. Well, I, what we do is we challenge what their other options are. And, you know, one of the exercises we do we asked them to tell us what they want to be, and then we write it all on the board. And, and you'll see that there are you know, all kind of things, rapper, uh, baseball player, football player, basketball player. 
And, and so one of the exercises that Lloyd taught us was how to get them to think about that differently. And we mm -hmm. think we get them to talk about it in terms of what career can you choose and what career has to choose you. Ah. And that challenges them in terms of trying to understand how they can get to where they want to be and where the control lies. And when they begin to realize that the football player and the baseball player and all that stuff requires somebody else to pick them and that they really don't have control over what happens to them there, you should see their faces change. That is a turning point day for them where they begin to realize, well, you know, that all sounds great, but I really don't have control over that. But you know what I do have control over? I can be a lawyer if I want to be because all I got to do is go to school. Yeah. I can be a teacher. I can be, a I can be any one of those things because I get to determine that. That's a phenomenal moment. So what happens when you face this this group of, of strangers, these these young boys who have been disappointed and let down by the men in their lives. How do you make a connection? You know, kind of piggybacking on what what Dewan just said, uh, we make that connection by bringing those men in who are taking care of their children. And we're not just talking about doctors and lawyers. We're talking about any man who's out there who can take care of his family, who can take care of his offspring. Okay. And that's how we do that. We bring in barbers, we bring in entrepreneurs, lawyers, men who are giving back and who can tell their story. But it starts even more at the beginning, more than that. After we first go in and meet these young men, after we talk to them, introduce ourselves, and make that promise that we're going to come back, and we ask them, do you want us to be here? We say, are, are you OK with us coming here every week and sharing with you and bringing other people here to share with you their story and tell you how they became successful and be able to take care of their families? And they say yes. Then we hand them a sheet with the pledge on it that they sign and they commit to as a contract. And at the top of that sheet, and we do this every week at the beginning of our sessions and at the end of our session, is that we say our pledge, which is I will live my life as though generations depend on me and I will teach and encourage all of my to do the same, silverbacks. We instill that thought in them so no matter what happens, no matter where they go after that point, they can never get that out of their head. I can never get it out of my head. It feels good every time I say it. It feels even better every time I hear young men say it. So we're able to make that connection based on that particular pledge and making them change their thought process change the way they look at life, whether they have a father in their life, whether they don't, whether they have men in their life who've let them down, or whether they don't. They at least know that they can change the paradigm of their future, and they don't have to just change that by being an athlete or being someone who sells drugs on the corner. They get to change their dynamic by being right there in that classroom listening to us and knowing that if they pick up that ac academic mantle and carry that forward, that they can go beyond how, whatever they dream. How are you able to successfully um, change the thinking from a, a sports kind of, 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 of mentality it, it, to an academic it, it mentality? Comes, it comes naturally to them. The example that he gave when we put on the board, when we put on the board those professions that you can control mm -hmm. and those professions that you can't control, that someone has to choose you, that mm -hmm. breaks it down for them in such simple terms that they understand it. Yes. They get it. And they realize at that point, like, you know, hey, I am good at mm -hmm. football. I am good at basketball. But I need to have this backup plan. The other part of that, the other part of that is we don't discourage them from being athletes. We do not. We tell them if they have a talent that they can use that can get them to college, that will pay for college, use it. Yes. We want you to use that. But don't forget about that opportunity that's sitting right in front of you while you're at college. Get the academic things that you need because no one can take that from you. When you look up Silverback in Wikipedia, it says, an organization of black men raising and mentoring boys without fathers. Why is an organization of African American men significant? So I'm sure all of us as African-American men would all give you distinctly different, but the same answers in that. And, and I guess the reality is life as an African-American man is difficult. We're not blaming society. We're not blaming mama and daddy. Uh, one of the things that we teach our young men is that uh, although life may be challenging, you 
or the person with the strength to be able to make a difference in your own life. And, and there is no time or space for you to sit back and, and belie why you are where you are, but that you've just got to make the choice to be where you think you want to be. And it's significant for these young men to see men like us who have really tranched through the same challenges. And I mean the same challenges. I mean teenage pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I mean put out of school. I mean detention every other day. Uh, I mean there's no food in the house. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mom was gone at work 18 hours a day. We've all experienced some of that in some kind of way. And you know, Norman, just to use you as an example, for the, I've been there when you've told your story. And I have watched those young men look in awe and amazement. And you can see the brain begin to turn on the notion that, wow, if he can come out of the Delta and do what he did, yeah. I ought to be able to do it in the cutoff. I ought to be able to do it in Holly Grove. Yeah. You know, at least, at least I can get on the RTA bus and go where I got to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's an amazing thing to watch that happen. And so for them to see a guy that looks just like you and make that connection, I think it's the thing that really is what's important for us. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Hey, yes. Thank you for having us. See you next time. Sure. All right. See you next time. Back with a final thought after this message. thousand high school students drop out every school day. Let's catch them before it's too late. To start helping students in your community, visit boostup.org. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Thank you for joining us for the Silverback Society Show, Raising and Mentoring Boys Without Fathers. The show airs every Tuesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. As always, we leave you with our motto as inspired by the great legendary abolitionist Frederick Douglass. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Until next time, I will live my life as though generations depend upon me and I will teach and encourage all of mine to do the same. Silverback. And those generations depend on me. <laughs> <laughs>